Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. President Donald Trump has had a rocky start to his administration, to say the least. His immigration ban has been stalled by the courts. His attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act was not just unsuccessful, but politically embarrassing. And the FBI and others continue to investigate the possibility of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia to interfere with and possibly undermine the 2016 presidential election. What does this mean for politics and government going forward? How badly has the Trump administration been hurt? How are Democrats and progressive activists responding? We'll explore all of this with my guest, a longtime democracy advocate, former head of both Demos and Common Cause, and now a senior fellow at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance at the Harvard Kennedy School, Miles Rappaport. Miles, welcome. Hi, Bob. Good to see you. Uh, it's terrific to have you in again. Um, so uh, there's just been so much um, in the news, but we've had a fairly good look at this president and his administration so far, even though it's, it's uh, barely a couple of months uh, old. How concerned are you about what Donald Trump and his policies mean for democracy in America as, as we've come to know it, in, in a broad sense, the democratic process? Uh, I'm pretty concerned. Uh, I do think that it's, it is very early, and the wheel is still really in spin. Uh, as you mentioned in, in your opening, you know, several of the things that I thought were really uh, harmful simply have been resisted or have right. not come to pass through one way or another. So it's very hard to say how much of it's really going to actually happen. But if looking at what he wants to have happen, the basic idea that there's rampant voter fraud in this country and somehow we have to make it much more difficult for people to vote. Right. The appointment of, of uh, millionaires and billionaires to the cabinet and positions, you know, just increases that level, that sense of inequality. And even beyond that, I think that the, the othering of the Muslim community and, the, and, and other communities is really serious. And I think that there's a potential here for a real assault on the freedom of the press. So you got some really deep potentially troubling trends here if they continue. Well, let's, um, you mentioned voting, so let's talk about voting sure. first. Um, I, I, this is an issue that I think is really interesting because Donald Trump and the Republicans for the longest time have been complaining about voter fraud. Uh, Trump claims that if it wasn't for fraud, he would have won the popular vote in the presidential um, elections. Um, the Supreme Court has uh, essentially uh, gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So there's this whole issue of voter fraud, on the uh, allegations of voter fraud on the one hand. On the other hand, there is the voter suppression that we've seen and that we continue to see. Can you try and, and, and make sense? Tell us a little bit about what's real when it comes to voting in America. Uh, interestingly, I think there is now actually de generating, developing a consensus that the actual incidence of voter fraud, i.e. people going to the polls and voting on behalf of other people or doing some other fraudulent thing, is virtually nil. And even in some of the Republican states where voter um, uh, 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 bills to make voting more difficult are going through the legislative process, they're now talking about the perception that people have of fraud as opposed to actual fraud. So it's very right. interesting. On the other hand, there have absolutely been dozens of attempts uh, on the part of state legislatures, uh, you know, and potentially Congress, I suppose, as well, to make it more difficult for people to vote, to discourage people from voting, uh, making the registration requirements more difficult, voter ID, proof of citizenship, shortening early voting hours, eliminating same-day registration, and all those things are, are in a toolbox of things that overall amount to a sense of voter suppression. And when, we're, when we're talking about voting um, in the presidential election, um, it's impossible to avoid 
the whole uh, investigation of um, the uh, rushing, Russian hacking and potential um, interference with the presidential election. Obviously, it's a huge partisan issue. There are investigations uh, underway. But give us a sense of why, separate and apart from the partisanship, right. all Americans should care about this. Well, I think there are two issues uh, to me. One is the, of what the Russians have been doing in the United States and in many, many other countries of trying to kind of destabilize the elections and plant fake news and a whole sort of center apparatus. And that's really dangerous for us, and we need to take steps to protect ourselves from it. The second issue, if it is true that the Trump campaign did collude with the Russian government to ch change the outcome of the elections, and that's a, that deeply questions the legitimacy of his election. I mean, I think that goes to, rises to the level of a major constitutional crisis right. if it is found out that that, in fact, is what happened. Because uh, you can then make the case that his Supreme Court nominations are made by someone who shouldn't have been president in right. the first place. So why should that person be confirmed? I just think it sets everything into a crisis mode if that turns out to be the case. And we don't know yet for right. sure. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Uh, in any event, uh, the Trump administration has been um, hurt significantly in, in the first couple of months uh, politically. Um, the Affordable Care Act uh, is still the law uh, of the land. Um, um, you know, we, we've mentioned some of the other setbacks that the uh, administration ha has hit, and, and Trump's approval ratings are historically low for a president at this early stage of, um, of his administration. How well prepared are Democrats and also Democratic activists to seize this moment, to make that, I mean, the Republicans still have the, the presidency and control of both houses of Congress and, um, you know, the Supreme Court is, is uh, potentially a problem. So um, can Democrats and activists uh, make hay at this moment? And do you see uh, that sort of thing happening? Well, let me start with what I think is actually the best news for our democracy in the post-inauguration period, and that is the enormous upsurge of activism and participation and resistance to the Trump agenda, beginning the day after the inauguration, which the by women's, all accounts, the, women's march. the women's march after the inauguration, which by all accounts, I think, if you count in the whole world, was the largest single mobilization in United States political right. history, larger than the anti-Vietnam War mobilizations. And that seems to be continuing. You know, the, 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 the congressional meetings where people turned out by the hundreds uh, to make the point, uh, I think that's really encouraging. So then the question is, can the Democrats or can the forces of, uh, of, of, of pro-citizen um, participation keep it up? I think the answer is yes. I think three things have to happen. The energy and the persistence and the getting out into the streets and using social media that's been going on has to continue. Secondly, that those, those new forces of people have to be connected to what has been the kind of institutional and organizational progressive community. You know, organizations like Common Cause, like um, ACLU, et cetera. And I think that's happening as well. And then thirdly, it has to translate into genuine activism, people running for office in 2018, people supporting candidates. And if all those three things happen, then I think it's possible that you're going to see a major, major change in the country come 2018 and 2020. Now, even if all, the, all three things happen, it's so essential to actually get people to the polls. And um, Democrats have historically turned out for presidential elections, and then there's a significant, if not a drastic, fall off in the off-year elections, which is how the Republicans have managed to uh, get control of both houses of, of, of Congress. Do you see an effort underway to make sure that there is turnout, not just in 2020, but next year, in 2018, for the off-year elections. Is there uh, a concerted effort to actually get people to the polls? Uh, yes, I think there is and there will be. Uh, I think people are, all of the um, upsurge in energy and people already announcing that they're planning on running for office, whether it's the city council or the board of education or a state legislative seat, you're seeing that, you're seeing that bleed over into the uh, election process. Then I think you will see both organizations as well, I think, as the Democratic Party, really working to mobilize people in 2018. And I think you're going to see a public that realizes that it really matters who controls Congress. Now, in your um, new position as senior fellow up at the Ash Center, up at the Harvard Kennedy School, tell us what the Ash Center 
is and, and what it is that you're going to be keeping your eye on uh, from this point on? Well, of course, the Kennedy School, you know, is, uh, is one of the premier institutions concerning about uh, government, innovations in government, and democracy. The Air Center is a, a, an endowed center within the Kennedy School that works on uh, governance, innovation, democracy, and it actually has a robust China program. So the Senior Practice Fellowship, and those words are carefully chosen, is an effort by the Kennedy School with, uh, you know, in, my, in the personage of, of, of my fellowship at the beginning, uh, to really make a connection between all of the institutional and intellectual resources at Harvard and the field of practice of democracy reform and participation and civic participation. So the things I'm going to be looking at are ways to connect those two in ways that amplify and encourage civic participation and voting and uh, um, changes in the, in the rules that benefit our democracy. I'm so used to talking about uh, politics left and right, uh, Democrats and, and Republicans, but I feel like that we're um, at a point now where democracy itself um, becomes uh, the important issue. So if you look at the problems, the political problems that the Trump administration has faced and you look at the low approval ratings um, in the polls, Try and think about the public at large as opposed to Democrats or liberal activists right. and that sort of thing. What do you think are the things that the public in general is, are most concerned about with this Trump administration and, and why the um, approval ratings are so low? Well, I want to go back a little bit because the, 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 the citizens' disapproval of government didn't start with Trump. Right. Over the last 40 years... We've had a government in, under Republican and Democratic uh, administrations alike where inequality has deepened, uh, racial equity has not made the kind of progress that we would want it to make, and people feel neglected and disrespected by the government. That's na that, that Trump capitalized on that in the election, but now I think he's deepening it because one of the things that the public doesn't like is the sense that it, of gridlock, sense that government can't do anything right, they can't get their act together, they can't agree among themselves. So I think restoring people's faith in the ability of government to actually function and having government address the problems that are real in their lives, those are the two things I think are most important to be done. And do you feel that the public is, um, has gotten a sense that the administration is not doing that even in this, this very early stage? I think it's a little too early to say they certainly haven't done anything that has uh, you know, indicated that they care about the people who may have voted for him or who didn't vote for him. You know, and the health care bill uh, was a, a transfer of uh, almost a, a trillion dollars right. from people who on Medicaid or on insurance to the very wealthy. Uh, the infrastructure program is nowhere to be seen as of today. Um, so I don't think you right. can say that, any, that people's lives are changing in any meaningful way. It's only 60 days, but I don't think people's patience will be infinite. So there are recent polls saying that the public uh, uh, does want cooperation between the parties. They, they have, as you point out, have always wanted government to work. They're, they're never happy uh, with gridlock and that sort of thing. Nevertheless, with the problems that the Trump administration has been facing, the Democrats have ad adopted the early strategy of uh, un uniting in opposition to, to the policies. Now, it, it, it makes sense. These are not policies that Democrats favor. However, um, going forward, is this sustainable or should the Democrats be on the lookout for something that they might um, be able to work with the Trump administration or with the Republicans on? You know, I think during the Obama eight years of, the, of President Obama's administration, the strategy of just say no all the time, no matter what, was what the Republican Party in Congress adopted. And unfortunately, it has served them fairly well. Right. I don't think the, gov the Democrats are going to do that because I think they believe fundamentally in governing and in using government as an instrument to solve problems and to make, uh, make be better changes in people's lives. You're right, though, that President Trump has given them nothing on which they could cooperate if he does an infrastructure program, you know, some, change, some genuine changes in the health care system. I think that the cooperation gene will cut back in. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we've um, seen um, is that the Democrats have been united in this early stage, united in opposition. But traditionally, the Republican, the, the, traditionally, the Democratic Party has been split between the so-called moderates and and the um, and the liberals. Um, they work together frequently, um, but sometimes not so well. 
for the time being, they seem to be united. Do you see that um, as something that's going to continue um, going forward? And do you see a more liberal Democratic Party emerging from this era? I think it likely is, the answer to that is likely yes. That is, I think a couple of things are happening. One is there is a tremendous grassroots upsurge, which I don't think many people predicted, and certainly the Democratic Party has not run itself in such a way to really encourage that. It was much more of a, of a t technical support operation and money-raising operation for Democratic candidates. But I think all of the people who are coming up, the sense that the, the, the people who voted for Trump in part, we're feeling rejected or neglected by the Democratic Party. So I think you see a Democratic Party which embraces the rising, the new American electorate, uh, doesn't uh, retreat at all from issues of racial equity, immigration, sexual orientation, uh, equity, um, but at the same time makes a sort of a more populist economic outreach to those Trump voters. And that, I think, is an available winning coalition for the Democratic Party, should they choose to accept it. So you've been talking about um, the activism that you've seen. You've been in, encouraged um, by the energy um, that's out there. But the Democrat has not had a deep bench when it comes to candidates, especially on the national uh, level. Hillary Clinton um, has, has made two runs for president. They were, they were not successful. Um, Joe Biden and, and uh, Bernie Sanders are not young men. Uh, do you see new faces um, emerging? And um, if that doesn't happen, uh, isn't that, uh, doesn't that become problematic for the party? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, and I think they, those, new, those new faces will emerge. There certainly has been a cohort you know, the, the call it Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton and, and many, many of the people of that era, I can consider myself part of that. Um, and I think they're exiting the stage. And I think what's going to happen is that uh, new people are going to start running, whether it's for congressional seats, Senate seats. And, um, you know, I think you're, they're going to come up in a more diverse uh, racially, more diverse gender-wise uh, uh, Democratic Party. And I think that's all to the good. There was a, um, a complaint in many quarters, not just among Republicans, that the Democrats had paid um, too much attention to demographics in this, in this past um, election, that they neglected especially the white working class voters, and that Hillary would have had a much better chance of winning the presidency if that had not been the case. Do you buy that argument at all? Uh, I buy half of it. I do not buy the fact that the Democratic Party made too much effort on fighting for racial equity and uh, expanding the demos, if you will, of the United States. I right. think that I would double down on that strategy. Demography and, and politics are heading in that direction. But I think it's absolutely possible for the Democratic Party at the same time to deal with and address the economic concerns right. of white working and middle class people. And they did fail to do that. Again, as I said earlier, 40 years worth of failing to do that. I mean, the quote, party of Davos, the right. international economic elite have failed us in the most fundamental way. I think Bernie caught that wind. Um, I think Trump caught that wind. Um, and I think that uh, if the Democratic Party can learn that lesson, really double down on the racial equity um, uh, direction, but also deal with the economic concerns of the white working class, it's a winning coalition. Uh, Bernie Sanders is still talking about that issue around the country. He's still very active. Um, do you think he thinks he has one more shot at the White House? Uh, I don't know. I'm not that close to it. Uh, <laughs> I know people like Bernie and people like Elizabeth Warren and a number of other people are making that. Robert Reich, uh, a good friend of mine, right. have been making that economic case. I think it will continue to be made, and I think it's the right case for the Democratic Party to make. They need to leave some of that elite Wall Street crowd behind, but I think... Uh, I think the time is ripe to do that. Well, you mentioned Bob Reich, and um, I thought going all the way back to the Bill Clinton administration that, that the Democrats would have been much better off, uh, I think the country would have been better off, if they had followed the economic policies that Bob Reich has tended to outline as opposed to the policies that were followed. Given where we are now, what are some of the things that you think you'd like to see the Democratic Party focused on that would be good for the country economically, but that you also think would be good politically? Yes, they should have listened to Bob Reich and others <laughs> at the time. Right. Uh, again, for 40 years, the uh, 
wages and economic well-being of ordinary citizens has been declining and stagnating while the 1% has run away um, with, with the table. So I think going forward, uh, investing in infrastructure and creating jobs that are good jobs, that are green jobs, I think is important. I think a real active labor market policy with a secretary of labor that would really fight to raise the minimum wage, to fight for, uh, um, you know, family leave policies and family friendly policies. I think there's whole uh, restoring the ability of unions to genuinely represent workers in this country. I think there's right. a suite of policies that could be undertaken that would make a huge difference and it's not too late. Donald Trump did not um, occur in a vacuum, the, the phenomenon of, of Donald Trump. And um, the Republican Party has pursued policies very similar, not exactly the same, but very similar to the policies uh, Trump is pursuing now uh, as president uh, for the longest time. Um, and I think that the Republican Party has made a devil's bargain between sort of being the party of the very wealthy, um, but, but trying to appeal to um, working class voters and middle class voters. They, they've used um, race issues and divisive politics and dog whistle politics and that sort of thing for the longest time. With Trump struggling the way he is and so much focus, uh, so much attention focused on Trump, is there a danger that sort of the ills of the society are all piled upon Donald Trump and the Republican Party gets a pass for what, what I think are um, some um, terrible postures and policies over 30 or 40 years? Right. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I don't want to give uh, President Trump a pass either. But if you look at the health care uh, debate, that was Paul Ryan's policy. It was Paul Ryan and the Republican Congressional Caucus uh, that produced that policy. Right. And it was horrible. It was an attack on people who needed medical care, it was an assault on, on Medicaid, on poor people, and a massive tax giveaway to wealthy people. That is the essence of the Republican strategy over the last 20 years. And I think in some ways, uh, you know, Trump was pulled into it. Uh, but I think Ryan and the, the uh, congressional leadership will bear the responsibility and will bear the consequences come 2018. Well, you see that we still see the same thing um, as, we, as we look ahead. It, it's the Republican Party are still in favor of these gigantic tax cuts. Right. Uh, they they want to get what they call tax reform uh, passed. But again, it's a tremendous giveaway to the wealthiest members of, of our society. Um, Trump says he's for uh, a big infrastructure plan, but if you go to Paul Ryan and, and, and the so-called fiscal conservatives, uh, which is odd, the fiscal conservatives want the giant tax cuts, but the, the so-called fiscal conservatives, uh, they're not too anxious to spend a lot of money on um, infrastructure. Uh, so w where are we headed here? One, is there a clash um, that you anticipate between uh, Trump and, and the mainline or establishment Republicans? And, and where does the ordinary uh, American end up in this situation? Well, I think the Republican Party has a major uh, crisis ahead of us, ahead of it. They have this kind of extreme right um, flank uh, that has really been driving the train in the Freedom Caucus. Um, the liberal and moderate members of the, of, the, of the Republican Party have generally been kicked out of the party. People that I served with in the Connecticut legislature, right. they're all gone. Um, so uh, I, think, I don't think they can govern. I don't think they can develop a tax package. I think if Trump really wanted to be bold, not that he's asked me for advice, <laughs> uh, really doing an infrastructure program in which he created a new governing coalition between right. the Democrats and the 40 or 50 Republicans who might be part of that, that would be a way forward that might actually allow him and the Congress to govern. I don't see any evidence of that, but somewhere in the White House, somebody's thinking about that. Well, we'll keep an eye on things and we'll have you back to give us uh, another assessment before too long. Miles Rappaport, thank you so much. All right, I'd love to be here. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. For years, activists, legal scholars, and others fought against the hideous policy known as stop and frisk. New York City police officers would stop hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers every year and subject them to often humiliating searches and questioning. The subjects were overwhelmingly black and Latino, and most of them were young, frequently children. 
The people stopped in many cases were shoved up against buildings for the searches or sprawled across the hood of parked cars or made to lie face down on the sidewalk or in the street. Nearly all of the people subjected to that vile treatment were innocent of any wrongdoing. 90% were sent on their way without being arrested, charged, or given a summons of any kind. 90%. Advocates of stop and frisk said it was an essential crime-fighting tool. They said if you got rid of it, crime would soar, criminals would run wild, New York would go back to the so-called bad old days of the 1980s and 90s. Well, we did get rid of stop and frisk, or at least the worst aspects of it. A federal judge ruled in 2013 that the practice was unconstitutional. Police could not just stop people willy-nilly, and certainly not based on their race or ethnicity. The number of stops by the police plummeted. So what happened? Did crime careen out of control? Just the opposite. Crime in New York City has continued its dramatic decline. The latest statistics show that this past February, for example, was the safest February in New York City in 20 years. What this tells us is that the police do not have to break the law in order to enforce the law effectively. That's all for now. See you next time.